Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Thank you, Dr. Cookson and Dr. Gerard, for the opportunity to talk today. That's okay. My name is Kelly Stratton. I'm a urologic oncologist at the University of Oklahoma. I'm just pulling up the slides. Okay, here we go. My talk is about next generation imaging and, an, and then an introduction to theranostics, which we'll go into uh, in more detail in a later talk. Will this, will this work or? Yeah. Okay. All right, here are our learning objectives. We're going to uh, look at current molecular imaging modalities discuss next generation PSMA PET and the assessment of men with biochemical recurrence after failed local therapy. We'll also look at patients who are known or suspected to have metastatic prostate cancer. And then again, we'll look at uh, radionuclide therapy as a perspective of theranostics. So we're all very familiar with conventional imaging for prostate cancer <coughs> detection, primarily bone scan and CT scans. Uh, these are widely available, and they have the benefit that these, these tests have been used to classify and risk stratify our patients. So historically, clinical trials have relied upon bone scans and CT scans to identify metastatic disease. However, we're now in a new era of molecular imaging, and the guidelines have shifted to adopt these new PSMA PET images. So, Whereas even a year ago, we said that you could consider novel PET scans like flucyclovine, choline, or PSMA PET as an alternative to conventional imaging. Now we're starting to see this transition towards a preference for PSMA PET imaging as an alternative to conventional imaging. So practices are changing, and this may be happening every day at your institution. When we think about PET scans, this is a slide that Dr. Gamella had uh, from a prior talk. Uh, the PET scans really take advantage of targeted imaging uh, agents that rely on a ligand, in, in the case of PSMA PET, a ligand to the PSMA molecule. Uh, and then that ligand it has a radio tracer that's attached to it that allows for detection on the PET scanner. Together with the PET imaging that's fused to a CT scan, and then we get very good images that can identify recurrence and metastasis. So that's uh, kind of how you have to think about it because there are different lichens and then there are different uh, radio tracers as well. This is a list of the current FDA approved uh, PET images for prostate cancer, the next generation PET images. So if you, if you think back historically, um, there were reports of uh, choline PET. That uh, choline really used a, a, a ligand that um, was based off of cellular metabolism and cell, and cell wall uh, synthesis, which is increased in prostate cancer cells. The, uh, the issue with choline PET is that it has a very short half-life. And so in order to use choline PET, it has to be on site with a cyclotron. And really the, the only patients I've ever had who've had choline PET got them at the Mayo Clinic. So there was limited access to choline PET. Next came flucyclovine PET, and this was a synthetic amino acid PET. So there's increased uptake in prostate cancer cells, which allowed that to target metastasis. Um, this has been kind of overtaken, but definitely plays a role in detecting recurrence because it has minimal urinary excretion. So you don't get as much of an obscured vision with the accumulation of the contrast in the, in the bladder. And then finally, PSMA PET, targeting that transmembrane protein, PSMA, um, there are two different agents that have been used, F18, DCF, PYL, PSA, PSMA, and then uh, gallium-68, PSMA-11. This has higher sensitivity than the others, has really kind of overtaken the next generation imaging landscape. When we look at the FDA approvals for PSMA PET, the, the first agent, the gallium PSMA uh, 11, was approved in December of 2020. Initially at just two sites, UCSF and UCLA, and then later um, the F18 DC, uh, DCF PYL was approved in May of 2021. That was the first agent that was really widely available. 
because the gallium pit image tracer wasn't really uh, commercially available until December of 2021. So we have these two different agents and we'll look at both of their uh, studies that led to the uh, approval. So gallium 68 PSMA 11, it was first reported in a prospective trial at UCSF and it should say UCLA as well. Um, there at those two institutions, they had a combined 635 men who had uh, biochemical recurrent prostate cancer after radical prostatectomy, radiation or both. They looked at uh, localization of recurrent prostate cancer and they found that PSMA PET identified metastasis in 75% of patients. They also found that detection significantly increased with rising PSA. So in this graphic, you see that as the PSA increased from less than 0.5 all the way up to greater than five, there was increased detection of metastasis. Interestingly, they found that whenever they directed focal therapy at pet, at pet identified lesions, there was a PSMA drop greater than 50% and 80% of those patients. So what we're seeing is, is that the PSMA PET helped identify patients with metastasis, and when we directed treatment at those patients, they responded. This study was followed up with a, another study from UCSF and UCLA, a prospective phase three study of 277 men with intermediate to high risk prostate cancer who were undergoing radical prostatectomy. They had a PSMA PET uh, preceding their surgery. These patients had a, a median PSA of 11. Uh, they had positive lymph nodes at 27%. And the study found that gallium 68 PSMA 11 detected positive lymph nodes with a sensitivity of 40% and a specificity of 95%. From here, we look at the F18 DCF PYL PSMA, and uh, there were two studies, the Osprey and the Condor trial. We'll start with the Osprey trial, which was a phase two, three trial, including two cohorts. Cohort A had men with high-risk prostate cancer undergoing radical prostatectomy, and cohort B had patients who had suspected metastasis or recurrence. In total, they looked at 385 patients, uh, the primary endpoint in cohort A was identification of nodal or extraprostatic metastasis. The primary endpoint in cohort B was positive biopsy. In the cohort A, which were patients undergoing radical prostatectomy, the median specificity was 98% with a sensitivity of 40%, so very similar to what we saw with gallium PET. Uh, and then cohort B, the median sensitivity was 95.8 with a positive predictive value of 81.9%. So in this graphic, on you see the cohort A, where they looked at uh, lymph node positivity uh, between uh, patients who have positive lymph nodes anywhere versus positive lymph nodes in the pelvis alone. And, uh, and basically, the study showed that the primary endpoint was met with a high positive predictive value. So this was a positive study for F18 PSMA PET. Next, the Condor trial was a phase three trial of men who had recurrence after either radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy, defined as a PSA above uh, 0.2 for prostatectomy patients or two above nadir for radiation patients. The primary endpoint here was correct localization rate. 208 men were, were evaluated with a disease detection rate ranging between 60% and 66% and correct localization around 85 to 87%. So those, two, uh, those four studies led to the approval of both of those agents. Uh, when, you, when we look at the two different agents, many institutions, you'll just have either F18 or gallium 68. If, if you have an option for both of them, you may consider whether one is preferential to the other. And really, they are not, there's no preference uh, one to the other. It's, uh, it's worth noting that F18 has maybe uh, uh, um, improved image resolution. It, ha it does have a longer half-life, and sometimes there's a greater yield in the manufacturing, but uh, gallium PSMA PET can be made on site. It's kind of, sometimes people refer to it kind of as a shake and bake because it comes in a kit that you can uh, manufacture the agent on site. So if you look at this study that looked at 191 men, comparing gallium 68 to F18 PSMA PET in patients who had biochemical recurrence. They found that uh, depending upon the PSA range, the identification was, uh, was 
for the most part similar. The only area where there was really a difference was a PSA level of 0.5 to 3.5, where F18 had a stratified sensitivity of 88%, whereas gallium 68 had a 66% detection rate. So there's a subtle difference in that kind of intermediate range. Outside of this range, there was no significant differences. Uh, it's important to note that it went, there were 25 patients in the study who had both of the scans, and then they compared them, and they were strongly comparable in their distribution of radio tracer. Um, when they looked at those patients, for the ones that, uh, where there wasn't necessarily concordance, it was really just that the patients who had F18 PSMA PET, some of them had a few more sites than, than the ones that, that were identified on the gallium PET. So, uh, definitely, it's kind of a dense study, but it does show the differences between F18 and gallium-68 PSMA PET. Taking all this together, the guidelines have now accommodated the use of PSMA PET, and we'll, we'll go through the AUA, NCCN, and EAU guidelines to get the full picture of the recommendations for using next-generation imaging. So starting with the joint AUA-SUO guidelines that were updated this year, Patients who have biochemical recurrence without metastasis after local treatment, PSMA PET is now a preferable imaging option, particularly for those who are at a higher risk of developing metastatic disease. Clinicians should utilize it preferentially when available. Uh, if, if, if it's not available, then they can continue to use conventional imaging. Uh, for patients who have non-metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer, uh, patient or patients should be evaluated with PSMA PET at intervals of six to 12 months. And then for those with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer, particularly those who are being evaluated for lutetium, which would be patients who've had prior chemotherapy and an advanced anti-androgen agent, uh, PSMA PET identifies patients who would be a candidate for lutetium treatment. When we look at the NCCN guidelines, PSMA PET can be considered as an alternative to conventional imaging. And in fact, conventional imaging is not needed prior to PSMA PET. And so PSMA PET can be considered equally or, or even more effective in the frontline imaging, both at initial staging and biochemical recurrence. The NCCN guidelines goes on to say that uh, choline and F18 flucicoline PET can be used to detect small volume recurrences. Uh, however, Studies of PSMA PET have shown it has a higher sensitivity, particularly at low PSA levels. So what this is getting at is that, is that uh, uh, flucyclovine or choline PET could potentially identify those local recurrences that may be obscured by the bladder. PSMA PET should be done before initiation of ADT because P ADT may uh, reduce the detection. PET imaging may change treatment options, but the NCCN guidelines wanted to make it clear that oncologic outcomes may not be altered by, P, uh, by PET imaging and that clinicians should consider the potential for Will, Will Rogers phenomenon. And basically what we were doing is taking patients who otherwise uh, would be considered non-metastatic or non-recurrent and then better stratifying them and then thinking that our outcomes are better because we're really better uh, categorizing patients before treatment. So we should be weary of the Will Rogers effect in, uh, in the use of PSMA PET. The EAU guidelines uh, also kind of highlight the point that uh, PSMA PET, while more accurate, there's no data that shows better outcomes. And so that is important to consider in staging patients. Uh, the EAU guidelines go on to say that men who are initially being staged, regardless of their risk group, treatment should not be changed based off of the PSMA PET in view of the current available data. And I think that that's a little bit hard for us to clinically wrap our minds around. I think it would be difficult to have a patient who has what is otherwise felt to be localized disease have a positive PSMA PET showing metastatic disease and not alter our treatment plan. So I think that there's a, a bit of, of uh, conflict between those guidelines and clinical reality. As far as using PSMA PET after radical prostatectomy, it recommends considering it as an option when the PSA goes above 0 0.2. Again, with caution that it, uh, if it would influence um, treatment decisions that we have to kind of 
weigh out the thought that it may not have as much of a difference in outcomes oncologically. And similarly with radiation therapy, uh, PSMA PET is an option. Uh, it, it also uh, identifies flucyclovine and choline PET as options if those are all that's available. The EAU guidelines specifically uh, discuss the PSA levels at which P, uh, met metastases identification occurs. And so um, you really start to see identification of, of positive lesions above a PSA of 0 0.5. And I think that that's a threshold to keep in mind clinically. And the radar, gui radar 3 guidelines are a way that we can uh, help deploy next generation imaging, particularly for biochemical recurrent patients, which uh, you know, suggest considering next generation imaging at a PSA greater than 0.5. Um, and so the, the radar 3 guidelines, I think, as we see PSMA PET being adopted more widely, will probably have to be updated from the radar 3 to, to a new, uh, more accommodating use of next generation imaging. Finally, just very quickly, we'll discuss theranostics, which is literally the combination of therapy and diagnostics, uh, a treatment that uses two radio-labeled ligands, a predictive biomarker, and then a therapeutic agent. Perci this is a precision treatment option, so we're transitioning from conventional to a personalized treatment. You can see in this imaging a patient who had widespread mastac disease who received uh, theranostic treatment, and then over time, you see the imaging improve and the PSA decline. We have a, a newly approved agent, lutetium, approved in 2022. Uh, it's a beta emitting particle, a radio ligand targeting PSMA. The VISION trial was a phase three trial that led to the approval of lutetium. It included lutetium plus standard of care versus standard of care alone in patients who had previously received one or two cycles of ataxane and then also a prior AR, path, AR pathway inhibitor and then had a positive gallium-68 PSMA PET. When they, in this vision study, lutetium increased uh, progression-free survival and overall survival compared to the standard of care alone. And so that led to the approval of both lutetium and gallium-68 PSMA PET as a way to identify patients who would respond to lutetium. So now we have this theranostic approach to patients with metastatic CRPC. It's important to note that in the NCCN guidelines, they support the use of either gallium-68 PSMA PET or F18 PSMA PET for the selection and identification of patients who may benefit from lutetium. So if you're a site that only has F18 PSMA PET, you should still be able to use lutetium in appropriate patients. And then finally, in conclusion, um, CT scan and bone scans uh, can conventional imaging in general remain widely available and can be useful to define our clinical states and the response uh, from clinical trials. However, PSMA PET is more sensitive and um, could help imp uh, improve detection of patients with metastatic disease. Clinical trials assessing the impact of these new images are necessary because we're really not sure how PSMA PET is improving survival long term. But we do have a new theragnostic agent, lutetium, which combines the imaging biomarker with the therapeutic agent. And so we offer patients personalized treatment. Thank you for this opportunity, and we'll move on to our case.